Okay, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Chris Martin from Bloomberg News Service. Um, you know, we, we, there's, a, there's a bit of um, reason in the, uh, our inviting prominent energy media people to be moderators, and that is that they know the kind of questions that the general public would want to ask. And hey, a lot of us in the room don't know those kinds of questions anymore. And B, if we do a good job of having the kind of dialogue we want, they can turn it into messages going back to the general public. And as I think you've heard from every panel so far, getting the public awareness of these issues and of this potential and the potential and the reasons for caring about transmission, getting the general public aware of that is a key part of what we really have to do if we're going to get where we need to go. So with that, let me ask Chris to come up or, or sit there and, and, and launch his panel. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me, John. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, this is something that I've been writing about for a number of years. Uh, if anyone saw the story I had in Business Week this week uh, with Elon Musk and uh, Warren Buffett in a grudge match, uh, <laughs> that's the kind of thing I've had to come up with to uh, tell the story between what's going on with the utilities and what's going on with distributed energy resources. You have to make it colorful or nobody's going to pay any attention. Um, that said, I'm happy to welcome my guests here. Uh, we did not discuss who's going to go first, so I'm not sure if you want. But I, I, I suppose, uh, Bill, Bill, are you going first? Yes. OK, great. So welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. I'm the uh, Pat Hoffman substitute. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as, as a New Yorker, I seldom turn down the invitation to come up here, although uh, turning it around in a day was quite an adventure. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, if you will, the tale of three quads from DOE. So there are two quadrennial energy reviews and one quadrennial technology review. They're all relevant to the topic here. And I'm going to give you a very quick overview and uh, then we'll cover anything else in the discussion. But basically, the Quadrennial Energy Review was an idea that Professor Moniz at MIT proposed to the president when he was on the president's advisory council for science. And when he became Secretary of Energy, he got tasked with doing it. So an important lesson to all the advisors in this room be careful what you recommend, you may have to make it happen. Uh, secondly, uh, it was put in place about a year and a half ago. The, uh, the task came from the president, and it's a White House report. It's not a DOE report, although there's no secret that DOE did most of the work. But we did have to find consensus with 20 other sister agencies and uh, the process was led by uh, John Holdren, the director of the White House Office of Science and Technology, and Dan Utek, the deputy director of the Domestic Policy Council. Uh, the Quadrennial Energy Review sounds like it would be something you do every four years, but that's not exactly how we move forward with it. Uh, Secretary Moniz had three years left, and so the notion of four years of analysis with the report at the end didn't work for him. And so we evolved the idea to there being an annual roving spotlight, is how uh, John Holdren refers to it. And so the first year's effort was looking at transmission, storage, and distribution. So we started with the midstream part of all energy systems. We looked at electric, oil, gas, renewables, and looked at that midstream part. The thinking was in the second year, we'd look either upstream or downstream, depending on what looked like most important to turn to next. Third year would be the opposite, the missing piece of upstream or downstream. Uh, the reality turned out to be a little different, and being uh, flexible and resilient, we, when we saw that the first piece took a year and a half instead of a year, the analysis actually took a year, but to get it out the door it took a little longer. The secretary said, okay, we get one more shot. What I want is I want to look at the complete electricity system. 
And so that's the QER 1.2 that was being rolled out today in the Capital Visitor Center. And uh, you can probably stream that and see it later. But I just wanted to have that piece of the picture. The other important part is the Quadrennial Technology Review. That came out about six months ago. Uh, that's about 500 pages of technology assessment on just about every technology that DOE has funded that it thinks deserves attention going forward. So that's a good reference document for you to take a look at. Uh, I'm not going to go through details here, but it's important for people in the electricity business to understand that all the incredibly rapid and dramatic change you're seeing has analogous developments in other parts of the energy world. It's happening in absolutely every part. Big changes in demand. The only place where demand is really increasing is in gas. It's largely around two things, power and industrial process use. Um, all the policy developments have helped slow down the demand. The energy security challenges are probably the only part of this picture that is more negative than positive. And that relates to both the physical and cyber threats as well as the threats around drastic weather. So uh, that's the world that we started doing the QER in. This is the Quadrennial Energy Review flower diagram. And uh, you really can spend an hour or two on this. I will spend a minute or two on it. But it captures the whole point of the Quadrennial Energy Review exercise. Now, some hostile groups I've been in front of said it also captures a lecture on how not to do a PowerPoint slide. <laughs> but there are powers that be who like it, so I like it. Uh, but the, the overall process had a few simple steps. We wanted situational awareness, so we wanted to understand the status quo, and then we wanted to understand the trends that were part of the current situation. We wanted to look at performance goals. Where were we trying to go? And the old Yogi Bear, if you don't know where you're going, you might not get there. So where is it we want to end up? Then compare the trend with where we're hoping to get by 2030. That was the goal that we were focused on. And we, in looking at that, then identified gaps. When we looked at the gaps, we came up with options for addressing them and then made recommendations. You can see all of that at uh, doe.qer. And uh, the, the website's at the end of this packet. But so if you look at the outside perimeter, you see the three national goals that we were trying to attain. Economic competitiveness, energy security, and environmental responsibility. They are multiple goals, as so many policy issues have. And often, they're in, in alignment. If you come up with a more efficient way to do something, you've improved the economics, you've improved security because you need less, and you've improved environment because you're using less. But there are others where there are trade-offs. And like cyber would be a good example. If you have to deal with cyber threats, that's a deadweight loss as far as your economic competitiveness. But it, you need it because of the security concern. Might be a wash on environmental. And then on environmental, uh, you probably are increasing costs versus the environment. It's probably a net positive, or that's certainly the policy goal. It may or may not affect energy security. So that's this overarching element of what we were looking at. Then uh, just focus on the center here. Can I get the dot up there? I'm not sure how to do that. Don't worry about it. But so the, the center is about energy infrastructure for the 21st century. So what we were saying is we're, we know we're not where we want to be. Can we get there by 2030? And it involves improving the economics, having enabling cost-effective environmental improvements, uh, being resilient. You, know, you can't stop any interruption, but you want to have a rapid response capability. And uh, all of that 
was brought together in 60 action items roughly that we're now tracking in terms of implementing what we came up with here. Now there was, we tried to do this look from a different angle than you've seen in most energy studies where you're going to look at a kind of fuel specific. We tried to break that up so you see these four circles around the infrastructure point. So we were looking at improving resilience, reliability, and asset security. We were looking at shared transport and improving that. That was probably the biggest surprise in this study was in tracking the Bach and crude development without there being pipelines, you were moving a lot of oil by rail. And when you did that on the rail, it affected coal movements and it affected agricultural movements. Turned out the same things were happening downstream on waterborne transportation. Uh, this was an area we, you know, we couldn't find anyone at DOE who had even thought about the question before. And then there are the issues around modernizing the security, that that's where you get at the suggestion about a strategic transformer reserve and some related areas. But you notice that it does still have modernizing the electricity grid. We couldn't come up with a way to crack that and slice and dice it in different ways. And now we'll be doing the deeper dive on that because one of the things we found was looking at just the midstream on electric isn't the way to look at it for what you need to think about going forward. I think that's very consistent with what we've been hearing today. You need to go to the end use. You need to go to the source of the electricity. And the grid needs to be able to enable in both directions, communicate in both directions, and even respond in, in many different ways. And so that's I think what QER 1.2 will be looking at, it's going to have a lot of, uh, it's going to be looking at questions that you haven't always seen DOE look at, and I think some of them are broad and maybe even uh, will be surprising. Like I would say there are questions about the jurisdictional breakups in which energy policy is developed and implemented today. Um, there are questions about whether the pluses and minuses of traditional regulation versus market issues. And, and you know, I think we've touched on a lot of that today. Uh, those will be addressed in the report. The, re the thinking on this uh, second piece of the QER is that it will be a final report around Christmas time of this year. We and the rollout is literally happening today. And the idea would be that there's a report that the new president, the new secretary can consider when they show up, but uh, will be developed with the thinking and guidance of, of this White House and this secretary. So uh, that's what I wanted to tee up for the discussion. There's a packet of slides that goes into selected details, and uh, hopefully you can all see that on the uh, website later. Okay, very good, thank you. Thank you. And uh, next up, we have Paul Santalella and, uh, of the eponymous uh, research firm. Thank you. So it's a great pleasure to be here. I have uh, both my own firm and also an association with Tabers, Karamanis, and Rutkovich, uh, uh, another economic consulting firm. So uh, yeah, we've heard some really great presentations today. Uh, by Audrey, by Richard, by many of the panelists up here. And you know, I want to go back uh, as a starting point to where Audrey started us off this morning. So she talked about her experience with Excel and the movement from uh, where we were historically to the creation of wholesale markets. Well, at the time she was doing that, at about that time, I was being a consultant for Midwest ISO and developing the case for why should we should create energy and ancillary service markets. And we saw two really important things. One was that you know, 15, 20 years ago, we began to develop the information technologies that would allow us to actually see what was going on in the transmission systems, to build markets, and to get, gather granular data. The other thing that we saw is that when we began to look at that data, we began to see really interesting things that if we took them into account, 
would end up creating billions of dollars a year in benefits for customers, which is what the organized markets have created today. So as we think now about the interface between transmission and distribution 15 years later, you know, we now have information technology that is much better. We have ubiquitous communications. We have less expensive sensors and meters. And we have analytics that enable much stronger optimization and, uh, and predictive analytics that allow us to look forward about what's going to happen in very complicated systems. So we are back at one of these interesting junctures. And so what I want to talk to you a bit about today is what kind of data you know, we're going to be seeing and how that might begin to drive a change in new business models and new points of interface between transmission and distribution. So let's start with how we, how we begin to settle things uh, you know, within the transmission system today. So loads we settle in New York on a zonal basis. You know, we have 11 zones and we, because we really haven't had historically great visibility of what's going on within those zones, you know, we price load on a zonal basis. Now is that really accurate in terms of the prices being uniform? Well, you know, we can look at actual prices for generators within those zones, and I put up a couple of graphs here showing the absolute differential between the zonal average, which these generators actually play a significant role in setting, and the prices at those individual generators. And for much of the year, they look about the same, but the last 1,000 or 2,000 hours, you can see some very significant differences. In one case, more, you know, peaking at more than $25 per megawatt hour difference. In the other case, peaking at more than $50 per megawatt hour difference. And if you saw Sergey's slide this morning about the changes in when uh, the system peaks in different parts of the Con Ed distribution system, one might suspect, and the modeling would suggest, one might suspect that at a distribution load node point, those differences would be even larger, and they are. However, you know, we don't really have the data for that, unfortunately, because while the New York ISO software, in its process of calculating zonal averages, calculates prices for those load nodes, it doesn't report them out of the software, so the New York ISO can't actually tell us what those prices would be at different load nodes. This is something that I think we would certainly want to pay attention to as we're thinking about a system with more demand response and distributed energy resources. Secondly, let's become even a little bit more granular and talk about how do, uh, does the value of DER, how do prices you know, change within a distribution feeder? So I put up here some, uh, some information from a paper that's forthcoming by one of my TCR colleagues and a number of other people. Uh, that is looking at and includes the mathematics for calculating LMP down to the load site within distribution systems. And this is illustrative data for very simple 47 bus systems, 47 customers or, or generation points within a very simple distribution system. And you can see, looking between the dotted red and the dotted blue line, that there is a differential, a non-trivial differential in some hours between the maximum and minimum distribution locational price and that that price changes over time and that it is different from what the price is at the substation where we can get an LMP price potentially. So what this tells us is that there is not a single value of D in the LMP plus D formula. There are many values and it changes by time and location. And that getting prices right, even down within the distribution system, may matter a great deal as we're thinking about an interface between distribution and transmission. So one of the things that we know when we go to distribution, I showed you both a reactive power price and a, and a real power price, is that reactive power matters a lot more when you're in a distribution system. Reactive power is very local. It provides the voltage that moves power through our system. And we have historically operated it on the sort of assumption that this operates kind of normally, that you're putting in capacitance at the substation or in the primary distribution system and it kind of gradually declines as you get out to the end of the distribution feeder. And we really don't need to worry about it very much. 
Well, when you begin to take a look at actual feeders, and I put here a three-dimensional graph that it, you know, on one dimension is time and on the other dimension is distance from the substation, what you see in reality is that there is lots of volatility in what voltages look like as loads change, this would even be greater if we had photovoltaics or some other kind of distributed generation on the system. And that, in fact, in some cases, we're actually violating our voltage standards without even realizing it because we simply haven't been collecting the data. So what can we do about that? So, you know, one company that I work with, frankly, it's a client, uh, has actually developed a, you know, a power electronic system that can, in fact, provide dynamic VARs out within the secondary distribution system so that they can equalize voltages across distribution circuits. Essentially, instead of providing voltage from the substation and transmission into distribution, essentially providing VAR support back from the distribution system, they can then allow the utility to set that voltage level at any point that they desire it to be at and, and do that dynamically across the system. They can eliminate technical losses, reduce generation requirements by 5 to 7 percent, and allow this to occur even with photovoltaic penetrations of 50 percent or more. So this is what happens when you begin to think about control at the point where there's actual volatility and recognize the variations that go on as you get more and more granular in looking at power systems. Finally. Let's think about a thought experiment. There was a mention earlier today about, you know, the thermal inertia in buildings. Well, what would happen if we began to think about buildings in much the way we think about batteries? Well, there's a very interesting paper that was done by a woman who's now a professor at the University of Michigan that did this for California. She said, you know, what if we just within a very narrow band that would be essentially imperceptible to the co consumer were able to take all of the heating and cooling, all of the refrigerators, all of the, the water heaters in California, just at the residential load, and this is just residences, and we were able to manage them such that we pre-cooled or preheated just within these narrow bands of a degree or two of temperature, what would that mean if we managed that like a battery? Well, it turns out that what it means is that most of a majority of the demand in any given hour in the state of California could be moved to some other time to help balance you know, the, you know, with the available resources. So instead of thinking about, as, uh, you know, as Richard was talking about today, building out resources to meet a peak demand that's only used about half the time, what if we could manage demand such that it was, it, it, it was matched better to when resources are available. And of course, that's just in the residential sector. If you look at a building like the one we're in today, there's a lot more thermal inertia here than there is in a typical house. And we can, in fact, begin to think about the way demand responds in wholly new ways so that we're not just thinking about demand response programs, which today are largely on-peak programs. Yes, New York ISO runs a, you know, a day ahead demand response program, which in the last four years there have been zero participants. But you know, we can begin to think about how we take advantage of the coming Internet of Things to automate systems that are already present in buildings that already have thermal inertia. And the only thing we're really lacking is some communication of the right signals and the price and the, and the, the predictive analytics which we can now do to actually take advantage of capabilities that we already have to make the system much more efficient. These are the things that we're beginning to think about. You know, how do they then begin to affect the relationship between an intelligent distribution system and transmission, and that dynamic will change the way the overall power system operates? Final thought, and that is, what does this then mean in terms of the model for the interface that occurs between transmission and distribution. And, you know, and we've, we toss a lot around a lot of terms, oftentimes not all that well defined by what we mean. Uh, but you know, I like to think of it in, you know, in, three, term, in three, three sort of boxes. 
you have someone who is a DER integrator. This is the utility who goes out and says, this is my hosting capacity for uh, distributed energy resources. I'm going to take up to whatever that hosting capacity and figure out how to manage it. Then you have a somewhat more sophisticated utility who says, I'm going to be a distribution system operator. Maybe I'm going to be an aggregator of aggregators with demand response programs. Maybe I'm even going to figure out how to dispatch some of these distributed resources for my own needs. Okay, that's, that's a progress. But then we could think about something that is really quite different, and that is the utility as a distribution system platform. Now, platform gets tossed around to mean a lot of different things. When I say platform, I'm really talking within the realm of platform economics. Platform like a, an Airbnb or Uber, for example. Platform economics have some specific characteristics. They combine technology with structures of rules and business practices that support a larger ecosystem. They are transactional. You are changing the supply uh, chain model from a linear model to a model in which parties on different sides of the transaction can transact in different ways that they choose. And that has very real economic effects. It creates net positive network externalities so that you, the more people participate in the network, the better it becomes. It creates learning effects as the algorithms get better. It creates innovation coming from across an ecosystem rather than from an individual firm. And that then fundamentally changes the business model in the kinds of way the, the ways that Richard was talking about you know, over lunch. So what might be some of examples of this? In the power industry, maybe there's a digital service platform that optimizes that responsive demand such that, that this building you know, is able to share you know, its ability to utilize its thermal energy in much the way that Airbnb allows you to share that, that spare bedroom. It could be in terms of a financial trading platform that begins to develop local ways of coordinating resources. You know, it's not at all clear that, uh, that you know, in the future we're going to have centralized dispatch the way we ha have it for the bulk power system. You know, we may be combining some degree of autonomous local c control, some degree of lo very localized markets with some resources that are already centrally dispatched. And those are some of the issues that we'll need to work out going forward. So this is a view to the future. We'll see, uh, we'll see how it develops. But the challenge, I think, is really for a lot of the people in this room to think about this future. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. That was illuminating. Uh, next, we have uh, Chris King, uh, Global Chief Regulatory Officer for Siemens, who hopefully has some solutions. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Chris. And thank you, Paul, for that phenomenal definition of platform. It's uh, absolutely right on. And I will talk now about the technology aspect of that. Um, it's really important, as I found in my career, to have a vision. We see a lot of change going on. We've heard a lot of discussion today about different uh, policy changes and industry changes that are being addressed in New York. But how do we get from here to there? How do we actually take a step, how do we actually make something concrete happen? And we have found that it's, it's really important to have that long-term vision, even if you're only taking a small step in the, direct, in the direction of that vision each year. Um, forces acting on the industry, we're familiar with these, regulatory forces, technologies, uh, driving down costs, coming in with new products and services, business innovations. Um, Richard Kaufman talked a lot about that and the return on ROI. Um, customers having new expectations. Um, I'm afraid that Bill and his uh, QER review actually didn't talk about the customer. Um, but we see that as a major force developing over time. And, and in fact, the industry has treated folks pretty much as ratepayers over time. But that, that really is changing. When we look at DER coming onto the grid, of course the grid wasn't designed for large quantities of DER, we see issues in technology, business processes, and markets. Um, the technology side, not designed for two-way energy flows, so we have voltage control systems that were designed for 
power flowing downhill from substations, for example, and then getting power pushed up the system causes problems with that. Overloading of particular assets. Um, in California, there's a, a well-known problem developing where at the end of the day, you have all the solar coming off the system, and then you have this huge spike in what's called net demand, which is the demand the ISO has to uh, provide for. And that is just getting worse and worse and worse and will, uh, unless, uh, unless and until there's some significant storage. On the business process side, so it's one thing to have a technology in place to do this. So you can automate the grid by overlaying an ICT layer on top of the, the wires in the substations. But what about the business processes that go along with that? So as Paul said, you need to get the price signals out there. Okay, well, it's very easy for me to send a signal over the internet and have a message show up somewhere. That's trivial. But the business process, where does it come from? Who does it go to? Once it's received, what system does it act on? How does it act on, et cetera? Those are what we mean by business processes. So a key one here is planning for distributed resources. Um, the planning process has to identify, well, where can they be? How much value do they have? Um, how does the interconnection process happen? How can it be streamlined? And then how do I operate the grid in this new environment? And this, this is going to be a long-term evolution. Today, grids are operated based on certain rules and constraints, and those are being changed and adapted as DER gets added to the system, as some of these things become market operations. And then on the market side, price signals, uh, we all acknowledge their importance, and yet they're not there. Um, we uh, have the good news that uh, we do have over 50 million AMI meters installed in the U.S. And uh, of those, unfortunately, less than 5% of those customers are on some sort of time-varying pricing, passing through some sort of market pricing. Um, California is going to actually 100% of customers will be on default TVR of some point um, as of 2019. Um, so it's about seven years after completion of installation there. Market access. So I may know about a market, I may have prices in the market, but can I access that market? And then how about engaging consumers in all this? So what kind of price information are we talking about? Uh, so there's market pricing, um, which is set in these wholesale markets and could be set in the distribution level market. Uh, and then there are time varying rates that customers actually see. One of the challenges in New York is most small customers, 80% or so, are served on default service. Should they be moved to a time varying rate at some point in the future? Of course, you need AMI first, so this isn't going to happen uh, uh, for at least a few years. Or are time varying rates left to the market to provide? On the data access side, there's really two kinds of data that we look at as important here. One is usage and billing data of the customers, which has huge value in market participants providing energy services, in providing DER, and electric vehicles, whatever. And then there's the system data uh, for interconnecting to the grid. So we look at both of those. Um, and then engaging customers with the information. And this gets back a bit to, well, you can put the information out there, but if nobody knows it, don't know how to use it, um, aren't aware of what the opportunities are, then uh, it's no better than not being out there. So here's our picture, a little bit simpler. Um, and I don't mean to pick on DOE because I think it's a wonderful study, but here we have the customers at the center. And we have them empowered. We have them empowered with data. We have them empowered with pricing. And we have them empowered with automation so they can control automatically in response to these price signals. And then around this, we have three key solution spaces. One, the grid control. And so on the grid, it now becomes observable with sensors and dynamic operating models. It moves from a single top-down network to a loosely coupled network of networks. Different areas of the network may be balanced or optimized, maybe, maybe even have microgrids alongside with that. Uh, control points, um, allowing for closed loop operations so you maintain reliability. Forecasting changes fundamentally because you now have all these DER resources and instead of forced forecasting a few centralized resources. 
security as always. Um, and as we go around here, we have the smart devices, the IoT that Paul was talking about. These are market aware devices. They respond automatically to prices. They move your thermostat down or up two degrees depending on uh, the season of the year to respond to prices and then let you flow through the next couple hours and save some money. Um, not even knowing that is happening, but doing this automatically. And improving uh, customer comfort at the same time. We also see a lot of autonomous rules or goal-based operations. The price hits X, then I will undertake such action as opposed to centralized control, which just becomes too difficult um, as the environment grows and the number of devices expands and types of devices. Uh, security again, standard protocols, so these things can talk to one another. And then on the market side, uh, pricing, um, location matters as we've talked about, settling um, consumption based on actual meter data, uh, and then security, of course, everywhere. And then just uh, wrapping up, we talk a lot about New York, and New York really is, and, and I do glo work globally, uh, Asia Pacific, Latin America, Europe, is really the shining star in terms of putting out there this vision, this policy vision of the future um, with more clarity than anywhere else and more specificity. And, uh, but there are a lot of other places looking at this, well, this as well, and one of the things that we at Siemens try to do is share some of the learnings across these different places. And they have these common themes, reinventing the grid role, integrating DER, new rate design models. Um, what does that look like? What's a, an optimal design? Being customer driven, again, moving away from traditional model, demand side, uh, accommodating multiple players and uh, market players and then the device aspect. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and um, we'll turn it over to the next presenter. Great. Thank you, Chris. All right, next up we have Steve Hauser, uh, CEO of Gridwise Alliance, uh, who recently came out with a report saying that New York was ranked 16th in terms of its uh, transmission grid. <laughs> Not the transmission grid, but yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, and thanks to the organizers for putting on such a great event and thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm very encouraged at the things I've heard said already today and of course this panel's the best panel so far so hopefully you're paying attention and not falling asleep after lunch. Um, I'm not gonna use slides, I'm just gonna give a few comments, a little bit of historical perspective and then talk a little bit about what the Alliance is doing now. Um, many of you probably remember in the summer of 2003 there was a major event that changed our industry and kind of turned us the, the direction that we're going now. Um, th that is that I founded this group nonprofit called the Gridwise Alliance. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Before that was, or after the... <laughs> well, so I was about to, I was about to say that, uh, Bill, because... Uh, Coincidentally, just a few days earlier, uh, there'd been another major event in our industry, which was the blackout here in New York, which I assume a few of you probably had to live through. Um, and uh, one of our founding members in those days was uh, PJM, and we used to kid them a lot about um, being responsible for uh, turning the industry, right, <clears throat> in, in, in at least two different ways. Um, we were just kidding, of course. but. Um, since then, the Alliance has been committed to the same mission we were the day we started, which was looking for ways for using information communication technologies, as some of our panelists have already talked about, to really change this industry, to use better information, more accurate data, <clears throat> better analysis, to really identify uh, ways to design, build, and operate this system uh, very differently, the grid. And when I say grid, it's, it's the transmission and the distribution grid. Um, I'm never sure in a conference like this what's going to be said, you know, in the six hours ahead of me. And, and uh, I, I think our other panelists would probably agree that we've covered the waterfront pretty well already, right? So it's not like I can add a whole lot. But let me just hit on a couple of highlights that, that kind of remind uh, you of some of the things that have been said already. But 
using these technologies and using this better data, as, as Paul was talking about a few minutes ago, it gives us the opportunity to do at least three or four different major things uh, in the industry. Um, engaging customers is certainly a big part of that, but that's kind of a means to an end. The, the end states is really increasing our asset utilization, and our lunch speaker mentioned that. I won't, I won't uh, bore you with all the details around that, but you know, he mentioned going from 50% to maybe 70% or more asset utilization. That's a huge impact on the financial part of this industry if we can accomplish that. It also means that we can mine for efficiency opportunities. Um, and that's efficiency in the load side and the customer side. It's efficiency in the system operation side. The utilities that have embraced this over the last few years have really focused on their own operational efficiency primarily, but they're starting to look a lot more at load efficiency and customer efficiency as well. And of course, we've talked a lot today about integrating clean technologies, uh, wind, solar, but also electric vehicle storage, fuel cells that are starting to come back again. Uh, and there's probably technologies that'll show up in the next decade, between now and 2030 certainly, that we're not even really talking about today. So all of that's gonna be important. The one that wasn't really talked about much until I think one of the question, questionnaires brought it up at lunchtime is reliability. And uh, you know, reliability is kind of one of those things that's in the eye of the beholder. So a utility or a transmission operator looks at reliability a little bit different than a data center operator or, a, or a, an aging parent at home with medical equipment devices that you know, rely on electricity to, to keep them alive in some cases. Um, and so one of the things that the smarter grid um, and this modern grid that we're, they've been talking about today really allows us to differentiate uh, reliability needs of the customer. So whether you're a military base or you're a first response re responder, or if you're a gasoline station that, that depends on electricity to pump your gas, or again, you're a, a homeowner that has high reliability requirements for operating your business or whatever it is, um, we need to identify those. We need to, we need to be able to address those. <clears throat> um, one of the things that the GridWise Alliance is, is really focused on over the years is our policy um, activities, as particularly at the national level. Um, I won't go into all the details of that, but give a couple of highlights, which some of you know about, which is in 2007, we worked hard with John Jimson to uh, craft Title 13, the smart grid title of the energy bill, congressional energy bill, federal energy bill at that time. And it really set the stage for a lot of the work that came has come since, right? It was the first time that we really had a national policy that addressed uh, the kind of things that we're talking about today. Um, and I think it even, uh, thanks to John actually, uh, it included a provision that required the states to pay attention to it, right John? Whether they have or not um, is another thing. Um, and then a couple of years later came the Recovery Act and, and a number of us worked really hard to get Smart Grid included in the Recovery Act um, that was not a trivial thing, um, those of you that were involved in that. Um, but as a result, we funded uh, over 100 projects around the country as kind of pilot projects, similar to the ones they're talking about here in New York. And those pilot projects uh, totaled an investment of some, somewhere over $10 billion um, in these technologies. And as a result of that, we've learned a lot, right? So. It's not that we got it perfect the right time, but uh, the first time, uh, every time, Chris probably can share some of those <laughs> stories as, as well as some of you in the audience, but um, we clearly uh, pioneered uh, systems, technologies, procedures, processes, regulations, and other things that went along with implementing those technologies. We're just scratching the surface. We have a, a, a very, very long way to go. The policy work we're doing right now is really focused on the energy bill that's currently before the Senate. Uh, if any of you track that, um, I'm, I'm, I haven't kept track of what's going on today, but they were actually debating it yesterday on the floor. Uh, we're hopeful the Senate will pass that. Um, the House has already passed their version of an energy bill and it'll go to conference and with any luck, uh, you just never know in these days the, the politics of today's world, but we're hope, hopeful we'll have an energy bill 
and there'll be some additional provisions that we've we've made sure are included in there that will address some of the issues that have been uh, brought up today. Um, Chris mentioned, so I'll just mention real briefly, the other thing we do, we've, we just recently, two weeks ago, released our third uh, grid modernization index. Uh, we take data across the country from states, uh, utilities, and so on, uh, uh, around uh, 80 different parameters that we look at, evaluate, uh, score, and then we develop a score for each state. Um, I'm not going to, I mean, you're welcome to look at it. You can download it off our website. It's free. Um, and we'll continue to do this again um, in another year or so uh, and just track progress as it goes. Um, New York didn't score number one, but they were, you know, in the top 20 for sure. I don't remember which number they were. But um, a lot of the work we do with this is really focused on what's been implemented, not what's been talked about, right? So. We really expect New York to score a lot higher, you know, in the next year or two as things become more and more implemented. Uh, so that'll continue. Um, the other two things we'll focus on this year, we're, we're, we really want to look at the things that have happened around the country over the last few years and continue to happen and look for lessons learned, best practices, how do we communicate to the, you know, 40 states that aren't really doing a lot in this space, the, the things that need to happen, the changes that need to to happen, the value that it creates, and so on. And we'll be ho hosting uh, a series of forums around the country this year uh, focused on some, some of those issues and some technical issues as well. Um, I guess I'll stop there. I I'll just say that the, the Alliance, you can look on our website, we're 70 or more companies these days made up of companies that include utilities like Con Ed, Duke, um, Centerpoint, Pacific Gas and Electric and so on, uh, companies like IBM, Cisco, GE, ABB, and our newest member, SmartWires. So with that, I'll stop and let Chris introduce Todd. Great. Thanks, Steve. And next up is Todd Ryan, Director of Regulatory Affairs at SmartWires. Thank you guys, it's an honor to be here today. And I realize I'm standing in the way of more caffeine and kind of in that lunch <coughs> lull. So I will try to be short and try to um, answer, you know, touch on a couple themes that we've heard about today. Modernization, uh, uncertainty in where the future's going, customer benefits, technology, uh, robust investments given this uncertainty. Um, and I wanted to, to touch, uh, where's, Navit, uh, Navit, excuse me, Navit Neat uh, Traviti. He asked uh, John Wellinghoff the question this morning about how we do uh, robust transmission or, or resili um, dynamic resilient planning. Is he still here? Well, I, there he is. Uh, I'd like to try to come back to your question after you see this and see if maybe you have a better sense. But I'd like to also turn that question around and ask you, given all the changes in our industry, given the unpredictable nature of where load is going to grow, net of demand, uh, distributed energy resources, uh, given the, the rapid change in our centralized generation, given the challenges of building transmission lines, how are we supposed to be able to know where to site these new transmission lines? And even if you know where to site them, do you think you can actually build them? And that's a really difficult question. And even if you do build them, are they still going to be useful 20 years from now? I, I just, I don't envy your job as to uh, if, if you do transmission planning. I just don't want to be sitting in that seat. <laughs> I, I think there's a lot of technologies, and I'm taking my smart wires hat off here, and I'm talking more about technology in general, I think there are a number of technologies that can, can look, the, look this uncertainty in the face and still be useful and be certain to be useful 20 years from now, regardless of which scenario comes to fruition, because we all have our opinion of where the future is, is going to come. Um, you know, dynamic line rating, advanced energy services, you know, a lot of the things uh, were mentioned earlier by um, the gentleman from NIFA. Um, uh, a lot of these technologies can, can be strong investments given the face of this uncertainty. 
Now, putting my smart wires hat back on, my CEO and president would kill me if I didn't talk about how smart wires particularly does this and what our technology does. So we call this the grandma slide. Hopefully this means that after I talk to you for a few minutes, you'll be able to explain it to your grandma and, and, and explain the importance. Um, in the top row, you have a traditional planning scenario where a utility looks out and says they have an overload. And there's a number of ways you can solve that today. You can reconductor, you can do a voltage upgrade, you can build a new line. Um, but you can take our first technology called the Powerline Guardian and you can install it on the constrained line. And that will help push power around that constraint, creating an increase in total transfer capability. And that can deliver renewable energy to load, that can just be more economic energy, that could be solving a reliability issue. It doesn't really matter. We have many, many applications. Our second technology is called the router, <coughs> and that can be placed on underutilized lines and help pull power towards the <coughs> underutilized line. Similar, one elegant function, pushing or pulling power around transmission constraints. And again, that one elegant function has a lot of applications. And so I'd like to give an <coughs> illustration of how we can use our technologies, but it could apply to energy storage as well or many of these other technologies, how you can do dynamic resilient planning, if you will, to take John's term. Um, here we have a scenario, just a complete hy hypothetical scenario. Let me just orient you a little bit. Um, in the upper right-hand corner, you have some coal plants. In the left-hand corner, you have a, a small cogen facility. You have some load distributed around there and a wind farm. And we're going to put a new wind farm on and that's going to cause an N minus 1 pre-contingency curtailment. And you need to do an upgrade. Now, you could solve it the old-fashioned way and wonder 20 years from now whether that line or that reconductor is still needed. Or you can put our technology on it and help push the power onto a parallel path and deliver that load. And only invest as much in the power flow control as you need to solve that problem. Now, let's say clean power plan comes into effect or the MAT standards and you need to close a, a, a coal plant. No problem, you can help import more power from another region and you can deploy them very quickly. And, and you, I mean, I'm hearing from utilities, say they may be getting less than a year heads up that a coal plant might be closing. And so traditional planning does, won't be able to address that. Let's keep going into the future. Now that we have less coal in that region, maybe they expand and to uh, bring on some more gas. No problem. We can help move units around to address the new need. They're importing less power. You need fewer power flow control to import power. No problem. Move the units and help integrate that new gas resource. So it's flexibility. Flexibility in real time operation. It's flexibility in quick planning cycles and it's, quick, and it's flexibility in being able to redeploy where that transmission uh, upgraded can be located. And, um, and we think that can provide this kind of certain investment, always guaranteeing that the asset is used and useful regardless of what unfolds in the future. So SmartWires um, works with a lot of utility customers. Here are a few ways that we <coughs> work with our utility customers to solve their particular problem. Because again, one elegant function, many applications. We can try to help uh, avoid politically charged constructions. Or we can help solve temporary problems through rapid deployment. Optimize capital investment. If you have 100 projects that you want to get done but only have the capital to get 50 of them done, we can help you maybe get more done for your dollar. Um, better help integrate renewables. Just, again, many applications for the same elegant function. SmartWires is also a startup, but we're not the typical San Francisco startup. We're more of a utility startup, which means we have people like Tom Boss and David Ratcliffe on our advisory board, making sure that we're making the right steps, working with the right people, and that we understand our customers well enough to address their actual needs. So. Um, with that, I uh, look forward to your comments and questions. Great, thanks, Ryan. Well, that was a wonderful panel. Uh, got a lot of questions, but I'll stick to just one to open it up and then turn it over to you because we've only got 15 minutes left. Uh, my question is, you know, starting the rev process, 
Richard Kaufman you know, brought up again today, uh, capacity utilization in New York City's grid is 54%. Uh, he w wanted to increase that to try to uh, get more efficiency out of the system and avoid spending a lot of money on new transmission. Uh, this morning we heard from a lot of people who want to build new transmission, and I think one of the reasons may be because of the increase uh, from uh, to 50% renewables by 2030. It seems like that that has created this uh, stronger incentive to uh, require additional renewables that may not be uh, possible with just DERs. Uh, just do you think that it's possible to get to 50% in 2030 with DERs, or do we need additional lines? So I think that we probably need more lines in some places, but it's probably, as I think Todd indicates, that uh, with electronics on the transmission grid, you probably can do it with a lot less than people are thinking in kind of a linear way today. So I, I will largely agree that I think we probably need some more lines in some places. But I think one of the things that we ought to be thinking about is we ought to be thinking about our planning differently. Our planning should be much more probabilistic, uh, not assume that we know what the future is going to look like 10 and 20 years from now. 10 years ago, very few people anticipated that natural gas prices would be the, where they are today. Uh, you know, we don't really know, you know how technology will develop over the next decade or two. And so you know, one ought to look at a, a probabilistic analysis in doing transmission planning. And one also ought to take into account uh, the value of the real options that you are giving up by saying, I'm going to commit an irreversible capital investment to this plan, which means that you're, put, you're, you're committing to a decision that you might be able to defer and retain some optionality uh, if you made that decision somewhat later. And, and that has some economic value that in traditional utility planning is often ignored. Yeah, and I, I would just add to that the importance of flexibility on the demand side and, and how powerful that can be. I mean, uh, one scenario is you have enough transmission to meet the peak, and if you can make it so that you shift enough load that your increase in total consumption over time is offset by uh, delivering that at off-peak times, then you might be able to continue to use that existing resource. Uh, their programs, Oklahoma has a great program where uh, there are 30 percent load shifts uh, by residential customers. So the, these uh, percentages can be very dramatic. That's a, it's a using smart thermostats, so it's not uh, it's a really difficult technology. And of course, price signals, they get uh, the financial benefits of doing that. Yeah, th there's different ways of calculating the sort of system capacity utilization, if you will, so I, we won't try to dissect that all here this afternoon, but, it, but it's roughly how much kilowatt hours can you get through the kilowatt capacity of the system. And it's the kilowatt capacity that costs capital money to build out, and that's typically driven by the peak. So if you can reduce the peak hours or the level of peak, uh, you can increase the kilowatt hours you put through the system. But the other, when you talk about efficiency, efficiency is the productivity or the energy services, the results, uh, the economic value you get out of the kilowatt hours you put in. So it's, it's, it's really important that we address both of those, right? So the, there's, there's reducing the kilowatt hour usage and, and per, you know, per uh, unit GDP, if you will, or whatever, per, per unit economic output, and then there's re then there's reducing the capital cost of the system, getting more kilowatt hours through this, through the system, and we have to do both of those. I'd say there's no doubt that we're going to need m some new transmission lines. I mean, but where they are, when we're going to need them, I have no idea. I, it's just clear that there's going to be investment in our transmission infrastructure, and it's going to include a lot of many different technologies, including building lines. Great, thank you. Uh, any questions in the audience? Yes, Jigger? Um, I was just talking to Navneet over here, and I, I just um, a hypothetical, I guess what I would say is that is it possible within any utility planning process 
um, to ever not recommend transmission. Um, it just seems like they make so much money on transmission that every time you ask them the question, they're clearly going to say, of course we need transmission. And so when you look at what like Richard Kaufman was talking about, which is capacity utilization, and what um, you know, Steve just you know, talked about in terms of capacity utilization, it just seems like we need an independent third party to do the work. I mean, is it possible to take the planning function out of the utilities? Uh, are you offering your services? Yeah, um, I, I've actually been surprised in the last couple of years how seldom something called the average Johnson effect comes up, which is a uh, classic economic study from like the 1950s that said, you know, if you uh, set up a system where the profitability for a company comes from building rate base, people are going to want to build rate base. And, uh, you know, actually you could predict that the ideal new power source would have infinite capital cost and zero operating cost. And, gee, we kind of got to that in some of the nukes. And, uh, you know, that's underlying a lot of what we've talked about here, and it does get at the incentives, but it's really tricky to come up with different packages that incent in terms of where we need to go, but at least I think we're aware of that now and, and trying to come up with, with uh, approaches that take account of, of the, the uh, effect to the customer. And I, I would like to respond to Chris, uh, Chris King's point about customers. Um, you know, it's a little alarming that I, I just, it was in marked contrast, I was in a discussion yesterday with some Japanese officials. They had looked at the QER with such a fine tooth comb and their questions were so detailed and so forth. Um, compared to, gee, the point was that we looked at transmission storage and distribution which means we were not going to either end, and the customers are at the ends, and that's what's being looked at in the next phase of the QER. So, I mean, that, that's why they weren't covered in the first piece. So. I, didn't, I didn't mean it as a criticism. <laughs> no, I just, it's just alarming that, I mean, yeah, they do matter. That's why in electricity, the secretary said, we gotta look at this whole thing because it doesn't, we can't get all the insights we need without looking at the whole thing. That's, so. that's good to hear. I, I, I do want to come back to this transmission point, and um, I've spent a lot of time in my career working with commissions on cost-benefit analyses and uh, integrated resource planning, and it, it very often is the case you want more generation, you want the lowest cost generation, you want renewable generation now, and, and that very often uh, requires transmission, and it, it's... Uh, but they, they do look at the, the big picture. They do look at the uh, costs and benefits of doing the whole thing. And I, one of the thing, exciting things about New York Rev is uh, sort of extending that to the distribution level. And you know, can DER, as part of that IRP process, fulfill some of those needs as in the Brooklyn Queens project? But um, I think it is fair to say there is, kind of, there is a neutral ar arbitrator uh, in the form of the commission. Good point, yeah. As a former manager of transmission planning, uh, let me answer that question first. We spent uh, most of our lives trying to eliminate transmission projects. In our company, our utility, we decided we never got a fair return from the commission. And the more we spent, the worse off we were going to be. We also had a business model that said that the, to the extent that we could beat the rate of inflation, the commission would treat us better. Uh, that was our business model. And spending more money on anything went against that business model. But the only other comment I'd like to make is, uh, Paul, thank you for introducing my company. The, the thermal storage in large buildings, uh, we've done it in Chicago, Washington, D.C., FAA headquarters, Sears Tower. Uh, we. As a routine rule of thumb, we take 30% off the HVAC spend. As a byproduct, we get a 30% peak demand reduction. No capital costs, drywall and concrete is free. Uh, 
I could also tell you, though, that there's some people here in the room that have decided in New York not to adopt our technology, despite the fact that it's free, deploys in a couple of weeks, really doesn't have any downside. So it's, okay. it's tough. It's one thing to have a great uh, engineering idea. We've done this with the University of Colorado Boulder, so we have some bona fides. Uh, it's a real science, and what they're looking to do with the residential is way beyond what anybody here has imagined. So yep. you're, you're right on. Yeah, I would follow up on that, that, you know, the, the real world considerations, uh, the stories you hear, uh, you know, some of the, you th the box at a building's uh, HVAC controls is supposed to have kind of an open access platform there. But uh, the HVAC contractor has a key to the box and they don't let other people in it. Um, the building manager, uh, the building engineer, his bonus depends on no complaints from the tenants. So he, he doesn't care if you saved uh, tw even 20% on the bill. He worries about complaints. And there, it's just uh, incredible how many of those uh, real world constraints. And they seem uniquely to be a problem in commercial office buildings more than any other place. It's, I'm not sure why that is, but certainly New York should take on that challenge. So do, just just two follow-up comments. One is I want to note that DOE through LBNL and others has done really good work on standards to try to open up the box and create open standards for you know for this yeah. kind of interconnection. I, the second thing is I, I think a lot of this has to do with getting you know the 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 economic incentives right. Now, you know, some of the large buildings are going to be, you know, mandatory hourly pricing, so they ought to have the right incentives. But most customers in New York are settled, you know, based on, on distribution company class load shapes that were studied over a decade ago so that even if you improve the load shape of your customer, neither you nor your competitive supplier would gain any advantage from doing that because you're still going to be billed on the, you know, in proportion to this old uh, antiquated load shape. So we really need to, you know, to think about, you know, how we bring the, the regulatory model and the market model up to the point where, where it matches the capabilities of, of the current technology. Well, one of the points to that, I think uh, utilities have been uh, very protective of ratepayer data. Is that something that's standing in the way of finding solutions? And when would you expect to get, and in what form would it take? So, I mean, this is a dialogue that, that, that has to happen. Uh, you know, I think there are solutions to that. I mean, you know, yes, utilities, uh, you know, the, the, question is, the question is often posed, who owns the data? And I think that's the wrong question. The question is, you know, who has rights to use the data for what purposes? And, you know, if you think about, you know, our cell phones, our credit cards, we disclose tremendous amounts of data to vendors, and we do it because we get value in return. And I suspect as we build business models that give customers value with respect to their energy data, we'll find ways to answer that question. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panel. Uh, thank you for coming, and let's go get some coffee. <laughs> we